Hey everyone, Chris here. Thanks for checking out the podcast. If you're enjoying it and learning something along with us, please consider becoming a supporting patron at patreon.com slash a teacher history. Or you could leave a rating and review on iTunes. It would be a huge help. If you'd like to raise your hand and participate along with us, you can find us on Facebook, Twitter, at a teacher fist, or shoot me an email, chris at a teacher history.com. All right, let's get on to the next episode. Hello, welcome into A Teacher's History of the United States. Thanks so much for joining us again today. Did you know that during 1814, a group of offended New England citizens gathered in Hartford, Connecticut to propose amendments to the Constitution to try to make up for their aggrieved status during the war? Did you know that the Americans and the British started peace negotiations just as soon as the American Congress had declared war in 1812? And did you know that the Treaty of Ghent that ended the War of 1812 made no changes to pre-war boundaries? All land gains that were achieved were returned to the original owner at the beginning of the war, and no one really won. But the Native Americans definitely lost. Did you know all of this? Maybe. Maybe not. Get your notebooks out because we will cover that and more in episode 107. Extra credit. The Hartford Convention and the Treaty of Ghent. All right, everyone. Welcome in to episode 107. Hartford Convention and the Treaty of Ghent. So last episode, episode 106, Bill was with me, and he is joining me again today. What's up, Bill? Welcome back, bud. I am glad to be back, and I got to tell you, it's uh, nice to be talking about the peace and not the war. Yeah, well, you've always been a lover, not a fighter. That's right. That's yeah, right. That's, that's very true. Dove, that's not That's how we balance each other out, because I am, <laughs> I, I'm very aggressive and have gotten in many fights with very large people throughout my life. Many. Many, um, like two, many. One, 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 all of them, of course. But uh, yeah, yeah. Um, you should anyway, see the other that, guys. Exactly, exactly. Well, when when you start saying stuff like that, that's that's how when you you know you're a dad. Um, that and uh, when you use the word skedaddle in a sentence. <laughs> um, so, uh, <laughs> which I which I have now officially done. Um, so, uh, real quick before we dive into episode one hundred seven on the Hartford Convention and the Treaty of Ghent, uh, I want to throw out another book recommendation, and this is a a bittersweet one because this book, Flames Across the Border, eighteen thirteen to eighteen fourteen, by Pierre Burton, was awesome. And the reason it's very sweet is because I just found it like towards the end of our podcast episodes on the War of eighteen twelve. Um, but but I thought but I I thought it it was really good. Um, it it was really good. And so uh, I I would check it out. Um, it has a lot of firsthand accounts. It is very detailed. It's just it's just really good. It's just really good. So, it I mean, it, it almost told like a novel, and it, it was, you know, a true historical account. So, um, I would check it out. I'll put it up on the website under the book recommendations tab. Um, once again, Flames Across the Border, 1813 to 1814. So, today we're going to cover the end of the War of 1812, just like Bill alluded to, and I'm going to sort of take the reins here at the first part of this episode and tell you a bit about the Hartford Convention, and then Bill and I will jump into discussing the Treaty of Ghent together. So what was the Hartford Convention? Well, it's important to give a little context to the political and economic divisions in the United States of America during the war. Following the American Revolution, right? So yeah, we're going, we're going way back, but don't worry, I'll be quick. 
Following the American Revolution, France was our primary trade partner. Our relationship with Britain was still strained, and it was difficult, as you know if you're a listener to this pod, for Jefferson and Madison to figure out a way to leverage American independence to get Britain to resume a trade relationship with us. Under Jefferson, of course, we have the Embargo of 1807, and then you have the Non-Intercourse Act, and Madison just continued those policies. During the five-year period prior to the outbreak of war, mostly Madison's first term, these policies had had a considerable effect on American merchants, something that we've talked about in this podcast, especially those who lived in the New England area. Throughout the you know, throughout New England and New York, the Federalist Party, in response to these trade restrictions, began to have a resurgence. DeWitt Clinton challenged James Madison for the presidency in 1812, representing the Federalist Party. The Federalist Party, that seemed to be dead in the water years earlier, had all of a sudden gotten a bit of a resurgence. So much so that DeWitt Clinton earned over 47% of the popular vote, posing a considerable and legitimate challenge to James Madison's re-election campaign. But something we've discussed in a previous episode, as you know, Madison was re-elected. With the re-election of Madison in 1812, the frustration of New England did not subside, but in fact became even greater. In 1813, during the war, Madison and Congress passed even more restrictive trade policies, making things even harder on these poor New England merchants. After Napoleon was defeated in 1814, and Britain turned more attention toward the United States, these coastal American merchants had to suffer the suffocating British blockade. On top of this, Maine which was technically still part of Massachusetts, which is something we also mentioned last episode, so if you don't know it yet, remember it now, uh, was being invaded. The British were continuing their occupation of the Great Lakes. Rumors of an invasion of Boston, much like that of D.C. or Baltimore, were becoming more and more common. With the blockade successfully preventing any real trade from the New England and New York area, people were starting to grow a bit desperate. Stuck in a war they believed they likely couldn't win and watching their banks suspend payment while the U.S. itself was running out of money, tensions were at an all-time high. The Federalist Party was still strong in the New England area, especially in the state of Massachusetts, and state legislators were blatantly and confidently refusing to lend all their support to the American war effort, with some believing that it was not in their best interest and or it would leave them vulnerable to the British Royal Navy off their own coast. And look, President Madison wasn't helping matters. He was frustrated at the seemingly blatant opposition many New Englanders were showing, and Madison mostly tried to wage war with Britain without taking their grievances into account. Well, at least without taking their grievances into account as much as they would have liked him to. Eventually, in September 1814, a few months prior to the Battle of New Orleans, Madison requested a conscription bill to be passed by Congress. This took New England resentment to another level. By the way, in case you didn't know, a conscription bill is like a um, a, a draft, asking for a military draft. So, New England resentment, like I mentioned, went to another level. So much so that Representative Thomas Grosvenor... I believe that's how you pronounce his name, not totally sure, uh, claimed that Madison was leading the U.S., quote, defenseless and naked into that lake of blood she is yet swimming. As calls for a formal gathering to discuss this crisis in New England began to become more prevalent, so did the calls for a secession in some areas. Some called for removing the western states from the U.S., shifting the political and economic power back to the New England region once and for all. Others proposed radical ideas such as impounding federal funds or declaring neutrality toward Britain in the war. Heck, the Massachusetts governor, Caleb Strong, even sent a secret mission, get this, sent a secret mission to Europe to discuss 
terms of a separate British peace. Yeah, that's right, a peace deal for New England, separate from the one the U.S. government was trying to work toward. Now, with all this being said, some historians discredit the idea that secession was a serious consideration, and and they, they do have a leg to stand on here. With Western land claims still attached to many of these states, a more reasonable representative chosen for the convention, the clear majority of these New Englanders wanted changes, but likely more moderate ones. Secession? That was probably a step too far. With the dialogue heating up, the Massachusetts state legislature called in a special session to consider gathering for a convention regarding their concerns. By mid-October 1814, the proposal to gather for a formal convention in Hartford, Connecticut was passed. Massachusetts sent a letter to other New England governors, inviting them to send delegates to the gathering. The primary purpose of the convention, according to the Massachusetts legislature, was to gather together, propose amendments to the Constitution, and work with the federal government to find ways to ensure the safety and protection of New England. So with all of the radical ideas floating around, the purpose of the convention, at least initially, took on a more moderate tone. In addition to Massachusetts, representatives in Connecticut, New Hampshire, Rhode Island, and Vermont all gathered in their respective states, complained about President Madison, complained about the war, complained about Democratic Republicans, and chose to send delegates to the Hartford Convention. For the next three weeks, these 26 delegates all met in secret, with no records or contemporaneous notes taken. Because of this, it's impossible to know exactly what amendments they recommended um, during conversations, who voted for them, and how specific they were in their demands. But in the end, the convention did issue an official report and list of resolutions, which was signed by the delegates present. All of them, might I add. Taking a line from those uh, Democratic-Republican opponents of theirs, James Madison and Thomas Jefferson, and the Virginia and Kentucky Revolutions of 1798, the Federalists claim that they were taking a stand against an oppressive federal government that was tyrannizing them unconstitutionally. When it was all over, the delegates of the convention proposed the following amendments to the Constitution. Number one prohibiting any trade embargo lasting over 60 days. Number two, requiring a two-thirds congressional majority for declaration of offensive war, admission of a new state, or interdiction of foreign commerce. Number three, removing the three-fifths representation advantage of the South. Number four, limiting future presidents to one term. Shows that they didn't have a lot of faith in the future president coming from New England. And number five, and this is my favorite one, requiring each president to be from a different state than his predecessor, which might be the most ridiculous proposed amendment. This provision, of course, was aimed directly at the Virginia dynasty of Jefferson, Madison, and Monroe. Notice that the desire to secede from the U.S., though, was not included in any of these. In fact, like I mentioned a moment ago, this may have never been a real serious consideration from the Federalist at all. Samuel Morrison, author of the biography of Harrison Gray Otis, who, by the way, he was – Otis was the one who initially proposed the idea of the convention in the Massachusetts General Court. Uh, Morrison says that these rumors were actually the fault of Democratic Republicans – Rumors about secession, explaining that, quote, Democratic Democratic politicians seeking a foil to their own mismanagement of the war and to discredit the still formidable Federalist Party, caressed and fed this infant myth until it became so tough and lusty as to defy both solemn denials and documentary proof. Now, in the end, we'll never know, but most evidence points that secession probably wasn't that seriously considered. But what's important to understand about these proposed amendments from the Hartford Convention is that these delegates were fully aware that Democratic Republicans in Congress definitely were not going to actually recommend and vote on any of these. They were doing this out of principle. It was a political calculus that they thought would pay off. 
Hopefully, they hoped, these resolutions would be embarrassing for Madison and the Democratic Republicans and set the stage for future negotiations between the New England Federalists and Congress when that time would, in their mind, inevitably come. Now, you may be wondering... So, Chris, um, I had never heard of the Hartford Convention before. What exactly came of all of this? How did the New England Federalists leverage this political unity for their own benefit? Well, it wasn't the best timing for them. See, when they did eventually send three commissioners to Washington, D.C. for that express reason, news had already arrived of Andrew Jackson's overwhelming victory at the Battle of New Orleans and the signing of the Treaty of Ghent. Once the Federalist Commissioners realized this, they felt sort of ridiculous being there to negotiate something on the basis that the war was dragging on and was bad for the U.S. when the war was over and at least seemingly, optically, was very good for the U.S. With the entire foundation of their political leverage taken from them in one battle outside of the Port City of New Orleans, their presence alone was seemingly subversive and optically probably pretty treasonous. The Hartford Convention, and this is why this is really important in American history, the Hartford Convention and the reaction to it was the nail in the coffin for the Federalist Party. In light of the incredible news about New Orleans and another, quote, victory over Great Britain, the Hartford Convention became synonymous with secession, disunion, and even treason, especially in the South, which was heavily Democratic-Republican and the stopping grounds of the great General Jackson. The Federalist Party tried to remain, electing a candidate for the election of 1816, but only carried three states. By the presidential election of 1820, the party was non-existent on a national scale, with only some local Federalist politicians continuing to have a small amount of influence in Massachusetts, and James Monroe seeing himself re-elected in the most dominating presidential election in American history. So with that, I think it's time to turn our attention to the Treaty of Ghent, the document that, for all intents and purposes, ended our prolonged struggle against Great Britain. And Bill, I know you wanted to introduce um, the Treaty of Ghent and some of the negotiations that led to it, correct? I do, I do, and... um... You know, I think anyone who's following along with us or anyone who has access to the internet could Google for the Treaty of Ghent and discover that it was signed Christmas Eve 1814. But as I said in the did you know portion of the lead in, the teaser, as it were, both sides were searching for peace as soon as war was declared. And that was in 1812. So you'd probably expect that the treaty to end a war would likely commence towards the conclusion of that conflict when one side finally understood their time was running out. To me, that's the conventional wisdom. I don't know if you agree or disagree with that, Chris. I would agree with that. Yeah, Uh, I would agree with that. As we wind down our series on the War of 1812, it seems to me that this event in American history can be best summed up as a war in search of a treaty. And I think that's going to catch on. When it came to the negotiations... I like that. A war in search of a treaty. Yeah, that's right. So so, so when I – I'm about to start talking about negotiations, but I'm not only going to be talking about the negotiations that occurred at the Congress in Ghent. Uh, This all started well before 1814, uh, certainly December 1814. So uh, the United States started pursuing a peace treaty – literally the day that Congress declared war, when Secretary of State, then Secretary of State James Monroe, urged British Minister Augustus J. Foster to work for peace. Then, only a week after the war was declared, the Madison administration let representatives in London know they wanted to begin armistice talks. 
Of course, the two biggest sticking points for the Americans were the severe trade restrictions via the British Order and Council and the pesky practice of impressment by British warships against American merchant ships. Now, the master negotiators and tacticians that the British were, they repealed the order in council two days before the American Congress declared war. They thought that this was a huge show of good faith to the British. This was meeting in the middle, and no one could accuse them of not being reasonable. After all, the restriction on neutral trade was the top grievance in the Anglo-American relationship. We know that the British thought seriously of the presumed effort, uh, uh, excuse me, of the presumed effect of this decision, because once the order in council was repealed, they dispatched a naval commander to propose an armistice. Foster and his British cohort facil facilitated that armistice with General Henry Dearborn in Canada. So that's it. The War of 1812 ended in late 1812 with that armistice. <laughs> thus giving rise to its name, the War of 1812. <laughs> of course, that was a that was a joke. Just kidding, yes, J.K. No, I picked up on JK. it, yeah. The United States repudiated that agreement because it didn't include an end to, wait for it, impressment. Turns out that yes. issue was a stickler. Uh, however... <laughs> Because this is a war in search of a treaty. Well, well, I mean, keep in mind, okay, so during 1812, during this time, Britain is still fighting France. So, of course, Britain is likely still going to be regularly impressing American sailors. No, so, no doubt about it. No doubt about yeah. it. The, because impressment also doesn't come up in the final agreement, but that's after the war with France is over. So there's, there's a much different perspective on impression. Correct. And yeah. the British had no intention of ever giving it up, according to uh, their high-ranking officials. They they thought that it was something that um, it was just a complete non-starter for them, whereas for us, it was a complete impediment um, to, to, to a negotiated peace. It had to be included, which <laughs> – Spoiler alert, Chris, you should have said that. It's not included in the final yeah. treaty, uh, which we'll get into. But because this was a war in search of a treaty, negotiations continued. Only this time with the Russians offering to broker that peace. Prede President Madison didn't even wait to hear if the British were interested before he dispatched his diplomatic envoy, which included John Quincy Adams. The only deal breaker the American delegation carried with them was on the issue of impressment. End it or there would be no peace. The British knew this uh, was the Americans' highest demand at that point, um, and they wanted no part of acquiescing to it, frankly. So what did they do? They literally never showed. That's right. The British ghosted the Americans and the Russians. But the British, formal as they are, did ultimately extend a counteroffer to demonstrate their peaceful intentions, this time to meet in Ghent, uh, which is now in, in present-day Belgium. President Madison agreed. He dispatched Adams and three others, all of whom represented different domestic constituencies and therefore also had slightly different priorities. Now, some historians have claimed this was the greatest collection of diplomatic talent the United States had ever assembled. Uh, the British, on the other hand, they sent their B team because the A team was where, Chris? That's a good question. Putting you on the spot. Yeah. What else was happening in 1840? Where did the British send their A team of diplomats? Oh, because they were negotiating another treaty with Napoleon. That's right. The Great yeah. Congress at Vienna. Sorry. That took me a second. I thought I thought you meant the other American nope, diplomats. Nope. I'm like, wait, we what? There. Hold we on. We got what? there. Yes. Don't worry. Yeah, we yep. yes. Britain Britain yep. sent their B team yep. to us. <laughs> yeah. The the A team was in Vienna negotiating which, an end to the war which, with Napoleon, yeah, which yeah. by the way, that dragged out for a oh, while yeah. too. Oh yeah. And and yeah. if we're being honest with ourselves, if you're an American we, in 1814, you get yeah, it, right? We for, yeah, you get we it. We defer the B yeah, team. Yeah, I mean, we're yeah. not Napoleon at that point. Um, so I would agree yeah. with that. Yeah, so it's understandable. Uh, not great for the British uh, because we sort of won the peace here. Uh, 
but it, it, impressment was still the top issue with with the Americans uh, when the Americans arrived at Ghent. However, uh, how <laughs> we are flexible after all. Two months into those negotiations at Ghent, the Madison administration officially decided to drop its insistence on an absolute end to impressment. Uh, with impressment out of the way, the British pivoted to their alternative terms for peace. And those were uh, that Western Indians were to be included in this settlement and that a permanent barrier or reservation be established for them. Second, annexing American territory in northern Maine and present-day Minnesota. Third, the United States was to demilitarize the Great Lakes. And fourth, the American right to fish in Canadian waters and to dry their catch on Canadian shores would cease. Now, that's a pretty long list of demands. The American delegation roundly rejected this list of demands, saying it cannot be supposed that America would long submit to conditions so injurious and degrading. What's interesting about this is that they didn't offer really any counter terms. <laughs> this is where it kind of gets problematic that the british sent their b team because the americans essentially started stonewalling and it was led by the old not at this point not the old we know him as the old kentucky warhawk henry clay henry yes. clay yeah i was about to say at this time he was yeah. not old uh, but so uh, yeah we we um he was the great negotiator. The, the, at that time, yeah, the great negotiator. But he was certainly a little overzealous when it came to uh, his um, his hawkishness. Uh, yeah. Henry Clay had some hunches, though, about the British. And uh, one of those was that the British were kind of trying to run the clock out on him, right? That um, that they could secure enough territorial ad advantages and enough military victories that they could start really dictating terms. Well, what Henry Clay knew was that they didn't really care. They weren't really on the clock. They weren't playing the same game as the British negotiators. And instead of offering counter terms, they literally let the British start negotiating against themselves. Because the next the, move. The, the, the move. the next overture that the British made was just, okay, let's just go back to the way things were before the war started. That was the next move. No, the Americans <laughs> offered no concessions. And, and it makes sense, right? Because uh, the way the war was going wasn't super great for the British at this point in time. The other, the other fact taxes were becoming an issue for the British population and estimates, uh, some estimates, uh, projected that we're talking mil like up tens of millions of dollars in securing a military victory in America. And when uh, the continental excursion was over, Napoleon had been thwarted. Are we is the British population really ready to foot the bill for another uh, huge continental excursion only this time in the new world? Uh, turns out the answer was no. Because uh, the British then gave up on their argument that it should just be reset to pre-war conditions. Uh, and for what for what the agreement finally turned into, I'm going to turn it back over to Chris. Yeah, well, I think – well, th thank you, Bill, for the uh, entertaining uh, walk through the negotiations. I do like this idea of the British um, negotiating against themselves. That reminded me of when I was a kid and I would do something wrong and my parents would say, well, what do you think your punishment should be, right? And then, of course, I just list like all the worst possible things and they're like, OK, sure. Yeah, let's go with that. All right. <laughs> um so, but look, it it, do, it does make sense to a certain extent. I, I know we're joking about them negotiating with themselves, and 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 yeah, like the guys, 
The guys that the United States sent were legit, right? Yes, we're the United States of America. But if like John Quincy Adams, who led it, then you have the great negotiator Henry Clay, James Bayer, Jonathan Russell, and Albert Gallatin. Like these guys were really, really smart and savvy diplomats. And eventually, after the British threw out a bunch of different terms and they were roundly rejected, what they realized is that, you know, not everyone, like you mentioned, was super confident in the direction of this war. The Battle of Baltimore, the Battle of Plattsburgh in New York, the Battle of New Orleans, you know, these did not work out so well for the British. And so at least when the negotiations kicked off, they were a bit more confident. You can understand why that confidence waned a little bit. Yes, the British, British had won a few key battles, and but they weren't going to ramp things up in the United States like you mentioned, Bill, um, now that Napoleon was no longer a concern. And up to this point, honestly, they had not shown that they had the ability to take land in America and keep it. In fact, when the Duke of Wellington was given directions to take command in Canada and, quote, win the war, he pushed back, stating that, quote, I think you have no right from the state of war to demand any confession of territory from America. That that Duke of Wellington, right? Yes, yes. Listen, right? Yeah, listen. He said, you have not been able to carry it into enemy's territory, notwithstanding your military success and now undoubted military superiority, and have not even cleared your own territory on the point of attack. You cannot, on any principle of equality and negotiation, claim a cession of territory except in exchange for other advantages which you have in your power. You can get no territory. Indeed, the state of your military operations, however creditable, does not entitle you to demand any. Basically, the Duke is saying that up to this point in the war, we haven't been able to take and hold land. So what makes them think that they can just demand land concessions from the United States. And in addition, what makes them think even if they can get that land, they'd be able to keep it? Personally, from the bottom of my heart, I would just like to say, great points, Duke. Great points. When it was all said and done, and the British were honest with themselves, uh, I think they pretty much agreed with the Duke's assessment. Liverpool admitted that, quote, I think we have determined if all other points can be factorially settled not to continue the war for purpose of obtaining or securing territory. And this makes sense, right? And Bill, you touched on a couple of these things. Britain was running out of money. The British public was weary of the war. Rumors of Napoleon actually restarting the conflicts with Britain were starting to swirl. And the best thing for Britain was to just have things return to normal again so they can refocus their attention on Europe if they had to. And Bill, like you mentioned, after months of negotiations, this is where both sides realized that the other was sort of on the same page. Now there was taking a commanding position in the negotiation. The U.S. Negotiator, negotiators wanted this conflict over just as much or more than the British did. So, on Christmas Eve, December 24th, 1814, the American and British representatives agreed to put an official end to the war. Now, as a listener of this podcast, you know that it didn't immediately end the war since both Parliament and Congress had to approve of the negotiated terms. But in the end, the treaty made no changes to pre-war boundaries. The land gains that were achieved by the British in the Midwest and the Americans in Canada and Florida were all returned to the nations. America, Britain, and Spain, respectively, who controlled them at the outbreak of the conflict. Prisoners were returned to both the U.S. and Britain, and Britain agreed to compensate the U.S. for captured slaves. In in his aforementioned book, which I mentioned at the beginning of this episode, Flames Across the Border, historian Pierre Barton summed summed up the Treaty of Ghent pretty effectively, explaining that, quote, It was as if no war had been fought. Or to put it more bluntly, as if the war that was fought was fought for no good reason. For nothing had changed. Everything is as it was at the beginning, save for the graves of those who, it now appears, have fought for a trifle. Lake Erie and Fort McHenry will go into the American history books, Queenston Heights and Chrysler's Farm into the Canadian, but without the gore, the stench, 
the divive, the terror, the conniving, and the imbecility that march with every army. Following the Treaty of Ghent, what we'll see is that the United States would not engage in armed conflict with Britain again until our involvement in World War I 100 years later. And as you may know, we fought with Britain in the Great War, not against them. That doesn't mean the issues and conflicts did not arise between the two nations, and don't worry, we'll cover them all in future episodes. But those issues were always resolved through diplomacy, not war. Probably the most significant impact of the war on American history was that the idea of a Native American-British alliance was over, once and for all. The Natives had been defeated, and the United States was going to have a much easier time forcing their way west with Britain out of the picture, which is exactly what happened. While the Natives were certainly the loser of this conflict, some Americans viewed the significance of their more notable victories as evidence of another victory over Britain, which was an incredible boost to the subsequent self-confidence and determinism Americans displayed in the years to come. On February 16, 1815, the U.S. Congress unanimously approved the Treaty of Ghent, ending the conflict that is so creatively referred to as the War of 1812. As you pack up your things, I'd like you to consider a question one of our listeners posed when we were preparing for our second Q&A. It was, did anyone really win the War of 1812? Well, Zach, unfortunately, for personal reasons, couldn't be on the last couple episodes with Bill and I, but he took the liberty of answering this question for us. Zach argues this. Americans, it is said, hate ties. But ties can be nice when it comes to politics, as both sides can claim victory. If we look at the ledger of success and failure, the United States started with a fair amount of failure. The objective to conquer Canada was a disaster. The nascent capital was destroyed. The fleet of frigates, other than the U.S. Constitution, would all be destroyed or captured. Yet on the other side of the ledger, the U.S. could argue it was victorious. The Shawnee and Creek Confederacies were defeated. The Northwest Territories would be secured, as there would no longer be British support for native resistance. The victory on Lake Erie and the early success of the frigates did show that the U.S. could compete as a naval power if they were properly funded. <clears throat> Thomas Jefferson. Finally, the victory over the British at New Orleans gave a strong sense of national pride and a free decor. That's why, in the war years after the War of 1812, this conflict was referred to as the Second War of Independence. For the British, the war could also be considered a victory. They thwarted the U.S. aims to conquer Canada. The U.S. war did not detract from Great Britain's primary national interest, the defeat of Napoleon on continental Europe. Sure, they had an army badly beaten in New Orleans, but that battle only happened because war did not reach that the war was already over. For Canadians, both English and French-speaking Canadians, the war was also a victory. York was burned, but other than that, the Canadian militia stood up and outfought the Americans at the Battle of Queenston Heights and the Battle of Chittagua. A nascent Canadian national identity can be traced to these successes. For American politics, the war will solidify a few trends. First, the utopian Jeffersonian view of national defense and government failed. State militias were too difficult to coordinate. The regular army was poorly organized and provisioned. The National Navy that Jefferson and Madison let decline would need investment to protect U.S. commerce, and so on. As is so often the case in history, national wars highlight the need for governments to wield power in order to coordinate armies and resources for the public defense. The result was an inevitable expansion of power. Second, American politics to the West will change substantially, too. The defeat of the Shawnee Confederacy and the Creek Confederacy will make ascendant a new policy of Indian removal that will appear with Andrew Jackson's presidency. Many Americans will adapt a viewpoint that Indian removal is the only option. The old model of settlers, land speculators versus traders and natives that had existed since Anglo colonies were formed will be gone for good. The power of the Western states 
will become offended, as well as new factionalism that will appear in U.S. politics all the way up to the Civil War. So, exciting times ahead. Well said, Zach. Thanks for listening, and hopefully now you can take pride in knowing just a little bit more about the history of the United States. Class dismissed.